You can get away with doing that, but you get so much more out of it, and I call that busking. I you get more out of it, and actually understand what's happening, and understand all the different mental things that go into speaking right to government, to promote your constituency, to promote policy. So understanding what's going on is key and recently, um, so Craig and I first met uh, when we were on a bill committee and I think it was 2015 um, and uh, I really thoroughly enjoyed that bill committee, it was my first committee. I enjoyed it because I was right and they were wrong and I knew it but um, apart from that uh, I enjoyed it because it was a topic that I was very familiar with. However. I didn't really understand why we were doing certain things and therefore I didn't always use it as well as I could have done. So last year I was on a, this year I was on another bill committee and I thought, do you know what, I'm going to go to the parks and I'm going to say pretend I know nothing, pretend I've never done this before and just tell me how it all works and that was the best thing I could have done. It was the best thing I could have done because I got so much more out of it. Because that is their job. Their job is to be expert in this. And their expertise helps you to do your job better. And I made uh, much more of that bill committee. And then the following one that I was on, and then the one that I'm on this week, except I'm missing it because I'm here, but I did it last week and I'll be on it next week. I made much more of that because I sat down and I said, Please just tell yourself that I know nothing and tell me everything. And then I've gone back and I've said to them, look, I know you told me X, Y, and Z, but I've forgotten what you said. And, and I'm not afraid to do that anymore because they love it. They love if you come to them and ask, because it also it shows respect for their knowledge and expertise. So don't be afraid to do it. And do do it out of respect for them, but primarily do it because it gives you the opportunity to make the most of the committee. And I think that was really all, oh well, just, just one more thing is just to remind you what I said yesterday. If any of you are thinking, I don't like asking, I don't want to sound stupid, I don't want to sound like I'm not intelligent. Of course you're intelligent. You would not have got yourself elected to Parliament if not. But just remind yourself, nobody knows everything. And just remind yourself of what I said yesterday, you are not an encyclopedia and you are not Google. Nobody is. The clerks know what they're talking about. You know what you're talking about. They don't have to come to you for advice on what you do. You should use them for advice on what you're doing and help them, get them to help you to prepare for your parliamentary work. That means that you'll make the most of your parliamentary time. Thank you. Um, um, Craig, we'll come to you next. Okay, thank you. Um, can, I, can I just start off by saying uh, that with all this stuff, um, this is our experiences. It's, this isn't us coming here to tell you how to do it. Uh, we're here and we're, just gi we're giving you the information, our experience, so that you can take away from it um, mm -hmm or whatever you choose to, to help you in your evolution, because that's what life is. It's an evolution to get through the processes here in your parliament. So it's not us imposing, it's actually us giving you our experiences. So you can take that, that information and you can do with it as you wish. Um, but all we can do is tell you what our, our experiences are. And what I can tell you is that the clerk is your best friend. You always, always treat a clerk as though it's your mother, uh, or as you would treat and respect your mother. And I've, my, my next point is, is I've put respect, respect, respect. Like your best friend, like your grandmother, and like your mother. And the reason I say that is because they are the font of all knowledge. Uh, with regards to process and what's actually what's going on here in Parliament because don't forget they often speak to many many members and they understand what's going on as well as what the process is as well. 
Now, quite often in the United Kingdom, I see private members' bills, for example, um, they will fall or fail because it's been poorly worded because the member hasn't s sought the advice from the clerk or indeed taken the advice of the clerk, uh, uh, sorry, gone to see the clerk, but not taken their advice. Uh, so that, that, that's how it can be uh, a, a real hindrance to us in, uh, a, 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 as we're doing our work. Now, just going back to what I was saying, I'll, I'll, I'll stay on private members' bills, because once you've obviously got your collaboration agreement through collaboration, uh, working on exactly what you want to achieve, the clerks will help you draft the legislation so that it's legal and it does what you want it to do. Uh, and that's why the clerks are so uh, uh, valuable to you as a huge resource in you doing your job. Now the clerks are masters at the constitution, with standing orders, with processes, and indeed protocols as well. They are all fonts of good practice, good governance, openness, and transparency. Uh, and they are also independent of party politics and impartial. And I can honestly say in my 12 years in the House of Commons, I have never had one show any form of uh, anything other than being impartial. They have no agenda. They are there to help you. And in the UK, the, the role of the clerk has been in place since the end of the 13th century. So it's a role that has been tried and tested for a very long time. In fact, so much so, so it was during the reign of Edward I in, in England. And like Anne said earlier, the chief, uh, sorry, the clerk is the chief procedural advisor who also advises the speaker. Now, no matter how much time in the National Assembly you spend, like me, I've said before, 12 years in the House of Commons, there will be always be some element of process or procedure that you don't know about, always. Uh, you will learn all the time about it. So it's vital to get anything done, you must do it to the laid down process. If you don't do it to the laid down process, you will probably fail because processes are there for openness and transparency and good governance too. Now, whilst process can be incredibly frustrating, uh, and sometimes it feels like you're swimming through uh, treacle, as we say in England, um, they are there for very, very good reasons. And when they're used well, you will always achieve a greater result. So, like I said earlier, you will fail if you don't follow process, and the clerks, without question, are there to get you what you need and are your best, best resource in this place. Thank you. You're here. Thank you, Craig. So we please come to Honourable and Doug Hayes. Thank you very much. And, uh, um, good morning. Um, I'm a member of Parliament and my fellow panelists. Um, it's a privilege for me to be here to share. Um, some of the experiences I have for the past five six years um, with regards to working with clerks here in the parliament. Now, when we talk about the clerks here, we are talking about the support staff. Um, that works directly with us um, uh, in our committees, in the table office, in the hands-up services, etc., etc. We are referring to those as the clerks of the parliament. Um, if you, and then the question becomes actually who appoints them? You know, when our 1997 constitution, section 111, it's clear that we need to create the National Assembly service. And the National Assembly service essentially provides services to the members of parliament. And they are headed by the clerk. Um, in this in instance, um, um, uh, Mr. Momodou Sisa as the head, and is supported by three deputy clerks. Now, who appoints the, the, the clerk in our situation here? The clerks appointed by us as members of parliament. And the Deputies are appointed by the authority. The National Assembly Service itself, their staff is supervised by the authority. 
and the authority are members of parliament, five members of parliament, headed by the speaker and four other members. They supervise the activities of the assembly service. Now, the deputy clerks also, they have their own responsibilities. Like one of them is dealing with um, admin and finance, another deals with legislative business, and the other one deals with legal and procedural matters. Um, um, again, that's why we have the committee work, the table office, and the handset service. And each one of them has very clear responsibilities as far as um, uh, supporting the members are concerned. When you look at the, 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 the committee clerks itself, they deal with solely with committee work, exclusively committee work. But then we look at the other table office. They handle the activities of plenary, they handle bills, they handle amendments, etc. They handle those, those areas. And then the hands up is for meant for record keeping, and these are all clerks. Now you'll see that sometimes in our parliament here, um, some staff from the hands up may be assigned to a particular committee. It's just because that the number of committee clerks we have, a responsible for the committee, is not enough. Right now, I think we have over 10 or 11 and serving about 24 committees. So that's the reason why they take from other you know, units to, to assist. But normally, we should have enough for each, each of the committees. And I think during the conversation, um, uh, in the first um, in the training we had, I think the TOR of each of the committees is very clear. And the TOR of, of the committees also is also very clear about what they're supposed to do. Um, um, and among others, they identify as a committee, we identify and monitor corporate MD, MDAs, um, we scrutinize, we review, we monitor performance, et cetera, et cetera. That's what we do as members of parliament, as far as um, uh, this is concerned. But generally speaking, the committees actually arrange our business in the parliament. That's what they do. Just generally speaking, the area of our business, how we do it. We know that we don't have offices here. We don't have research assistants. So it is the responsibility of the um, uh, class to assist us to organize ourselves better so that when we come here in the morning, we know where to start. In fact, they help us to create a, a calendar for, for the 12-month calendar so we know every month what we are supposed to do. And that is the responsibility of, um, um, you know, of the class of the parliament. They give us guide or guidance. Um, uh, they also take notes when we, when we meet, and they provide record keeping from the hands up. So everything that we say in the plenary is actually recorded for posterity. And uh, sometimes you see that the, the, the courts may request that recorded. Um, because sometimes when they're making judgment, sometimes on a particular law, when there's a dispute, but what actually law actually means in terms of interpretation, they may go back to the parliament to understand how the members were thinking at the time of making the law. So that's the reason why the hands up services, they keep all the records for us so they can refer. Because sometimes, you know, the literal meaning may be different from what we are thinking. So the, so the record keeping is also very quite important. So the clerks also help us generate reports and also certify the passage of bills. Once bills are done, you know, we go to the last stage. And with all the amendments we've made, they prepare the final bill and they bring it back to the, the table office and for them to review and for them to certify and send it back to the president um, uh, for, 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 for assent. So it is really very clear that the class actually have a responsibility and we also have a responsibility. But then how can we make this work better in terms of strengthening it? The success of any parliament, by and large, depends on the supporting caste. And the supporting caste is the class we have. If the class do not work well, I can tell you we, will, we are bound to fail, or it's going to take a very long time before we are, we are, we are successful in what we have, wherever we are trying to do. So it is important that um, we provide continuous training for them, and above all, to have a very clear understanding about our responsibilities. They support us. They are our support staff. Uh, but you're going to see that in some instances, you see MPs may make class with some of the clerks, um, which is unfortunate, but we must be really very careful that these are people, they are here to support what we do, to support the work that we do. So for us to have effective plan, an effective, very effective plan, the, there needs to be a very good correlation among the clerks that we actually have here. And uh, above all, the respect, mutual respect between us and the clerks also is very essential for them to be able to do their work. And uh, finally, we need to give them moral support. If you give them the moral support, that is the motivation they have. They are paid to do a work, but the moral support that we give them is also going to allow us to be, for them to be able to give us, you know, more work.
So the continuous training of the class also, um, uh, you know, because better because of the better your class, the better you are as an MP because they can help you in um, a lot of other areas. Now I can tell you here in the in the in our parliament, it's very difficult for us to understand the clerk, the deputy clerks, and other directors, the party they support. I do not know. They have not shown any partisanship in, as far as my experience is concerned. One of the deputy clerks actually comes from the same village with me, but he's not even registered in my constituents, and that tells you something. So, so let's understand that they are not here for any political party. They are here to do a work, and they are here to support us. They are our supporting cast in whatever we try to do. So the better the relationship between us and the class, the better we are as a parliament. So I would end here, um, if in case we have more, more questions. Yeah. Thank you to all our panelists. Um, so we're going to get to the Q&A in a minute, but the first thing I wanted to do was actually go into an interactive exercise to consider what's been discussed here um, in more practical terms. So I have uh, behind me a presentation. So we have two scenarios, two very similar scenarios here, and I would like to split into two groups here. So everyone on these tables, and this row of tables here, directly in front of you, and this row of tables here on to the left. You are members, and I'd like you in your tables to consider the following scenario. You are new NAM, you have not met any clerk before, but someone you know was previously at NAM and has told you that clerks like to enforce bondless rules. You would like to ask a couple of questions to the minister. You go to the clerk and ask it to file it for you, but he refuses. So I would like to just in a minute after I um, finish speaking for you to discuss this in your groups. We have we also have a scenario for clerks as well. So on the right hand side, on the right, on the two right hand rows, I would like you to um, consider this from the perspective of the clerk. You're not a member for these two minutes for a clerk. An NAM asked you to table a number of questions for him. You did some research and found a very, very similar question on the exact topic was asked quite recently. According to the rules, you cannot table this question. You have to tell the NEM you cannot assist them in this request. So, unless uh, does anyone have any questions about how that um, will play out? Great. So, on the right in the tables, please consider it from the perspective of a clerk, and on the left, please consider the first scenario from the perspective of a member. So we'll give you two minutes to discuss that in your groups, and then we'll come back for answers. Can just discuss, yeah. Yes, yeah, just yeah, yes, discuss it when you come in. Yeah, yes, no, we've got to put up. It's one table, sorry. One table. Yeah, just um, discuss it in one table, not in one group. Don't necessarily have to do that. No, you don't have to read it.
Okay, so I will to bring this government to the close here, and I'd like to hear from Okay, in which case, let's um, let's come to the other to the other side for reflections on this scenario for the clerks. Would you, uh, gentlemen over there in the blue, which come will come to you first? Um, we're only going to take one contribution from each table. So, would the further group over there like to add something? Yes. Okay, that's good. One last chance for this table to contribute. Yes. Yeah. So, can you repeat that? Consulting the office of the class. Yeah. On why did he use on this? Okay, okay. 
I would like to come to our panel to ask if they have any reflections either on what they would do in this situation or on what's been uh, talked about on the floor. Yeah, I, I would say it's, it's just about uh, communicating, isn't it? So if you are a NAM and the clerk is refusing but not telling you, then there's a communication problem there. So the clerk really should be saying to you, look, it's not me refusing, these are the rules and this is why the rules exist. Um, but if the clerk doesn't say that, and from what we've heard, they're extremely busy, they seem to have about three committees each, I don't know how they cope, but if the clerk fails to explain, then really, the, I, think, I think somebody had said, we'll ask, what is the reasoning behind that? And if we don't get a proper answer, then we'll write to the head clerk. And I think that makes sense. It's just about communicating. Yeah, the, excuse me, the only thing I would say is that if, if a clerk won't take a question for you, it's probably because it's badly worded. But they should be communicating that to you in the first place. Um, and similarly, the other reason may be the second scenario on the, on the screen there where uh, the question has been recently asked um, and the rules state you can't consistently ask the same question. Uh, but it's quite straightforward, it's like everything else. If somebody says no to you, you always ask them why uh, and, and uh, I'm sure they will explain the reasons why and it may be that it's just badly worded. Um, and so, uh, um, uh, uh, so then the thing to do is go back to them and say, well, how would you word it? Mm. Uh, because they're, they're very good at putting it in parliamentary format uh, so that you get the right answer that you want. Thank you. Honourable and Bo, would you like to reflect? Yes, um, actually it's kind of very similar. Um, uh, essentially, um, some of the questions are actually related um, uh, but, um, for various reasons. Um, for example, you can't ask the same question in the same session. For example, if Ablai asks a question for the particular ministry for the same thing, no one member can ask the same question in the same session because it's kind of a repetition. Um, sometimes if a member wants to ask a question and he can state what he's actually saying, the question will be rejected. But in any case, the clerk should tell you why and he should refer you to the exact standing order that makes the question rejected. In fact, we have instances here where the clerk actually assists you to reframe the question to ensure it's actually accepted. Like for people like me who ask too many questions, um, sometimes they may ask me to, to make a short answer as possible. <laughs> Just to start this, yeah. uh, but the experience we have here is um, the clerk will actually tell you and they will give you the reason and they will assist you to reframe the question. Um, that's the experience we have here. So, so in any case, if a clerk rejects a question, you should ask the question why it's been rejected, and they will define it to the exact standing order to tell you um, what it is. Thank you um, to our panelists for responding to that. Um, so I would now like to bring it on to um, Q and A's. So if anyone has any questions about what was discussed in the presentations beforehand, or indeed anything which was raised in the course of that exercise, please raise your hand now. Yes? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the presentation. Uh, uh, you just mentioned the statement with regards to the contract of the of the class, you said they arranged our business and how to do it. Did that mean that we are just using They arranged our work for us and how to do it. What do you do? understand? So, and also, uh, with regards to our economy class, uh, it's like uh, if you pay attention to uh, all the details and explanations they do, or in most cases, it's an invitation. I've seen that the activity plan was putting for the order to accept. Uh, my biggest shock was this uh, concept was to roll up uh, for the various committees. I, I, I'm chairing two committees the uh, uh, subsidiary administration and the economy ministry. So what I realized, what was the concept you know, that was prepared last year is the same thing today. It is the same was submitted. But they are by a the people are more. It didn't matter last year. <laughs> we want to be here, here, here different year. So I have to work <laughs> and change everything. So the fact is that we allow, it's like they are overstretched. The fact is the committee class they are, are overstretched. At one point, if we don't help them, we are not going to uh, see that sense. So if we want to rely on what you said, arrange our business and how to do it, then we overslept. So at one point, the company cares, we 
Thank you. Who wants to comment on that? Yes, um, I'll comment on that. Um, I think this statement is actually very clear. I think there is no member of parliament here outside the, the, the speaker, the deputy speaker, the majority leader, minority leader, actually have an office here or an office system. So, so meaning, uh, if a mail comes, <coughs> is sent to you as chair of the committee, what actually happens? You have to be here. If you are in here only during sessions and when you have the committee meetings, otherwise, members don't come here. So that's the reason why you have committee class that will be here to assist you for organizing yourself. It doesn't mean that you as much they will organize. No, they will organize the work that you have. If there's a letter that comes in and is a response to the committee of agriculture, they will clash with it and ask the um, uh, um, you know the records office to give it to the chair of the agriculture committee for you to do the food. The work of the committee is actually not final. When they make a consent note or when they write um, any proposal. The onus is on the chairperson of the committee to certify it and, and certify himself with it to ensure that it's okay with it. Whatever they give us is not final. They can advise us, they can give us a draft, and it's up to us as chairperson and vice chairpersons to look at it and certify it to the best of our ability and we go with it. So they can just give us advice and they give us a concept note, and it's up to us to look at it, to agree or to disagree. Where you disagree, you know, whatever you say is fine. Um, yes, you uh, were asking similar things yesterday, I think. And um, so just to clarify, in terms of what we're doing, I'll give you an example of what is actually happening at the moment with me. We have a thing called a 10 minute rule bill. And by tomorrow, um, those of us who want to get one of these, the first 10, um, where we can try to change legislation, have to have our applications are by tomorrow. We have to have the title of the 10 minute rule bill and the description of it. And I'm currently doing a to and fro with a, a clerk who is telling me, it is not telling me, she's advising me to change the wording. So what I've come to the conclusion is that her wording will make it more likely that it will get through, but it waters down what I want to say. So I have to make a decision there. Do I want to take the risk that it won't get through, but I'll get to make the point that I want to make politically? Or do I take her advice about slightly watering it down because it's far more likely to pass that way? And that's where they're really good. Now I have to make that final decision and I have to make it by tomorrow morning. Um, so it's, I just think it's useful to know that it's not about them telling you what to do, it's about them advising you on your options really, and, and giving you some background. Greg, would you like to come in there? No, just, just really to reiterate what Anne just said, I think, um, what I would say is, I know you don't have to tell you the rules here, but it's, it's similar to a private member speak, is what Anne's talking about. Really. Um, um, it, it is so important to go back to what we said before about collaborative working. The clerks will advise you to go one way, or will be advising Anne to go the way that she's gone, uh, or wants her to go, because she actually wants Anne to succeed. Um, they don't want Anne to fail. And sometimes you have to just amend your thinking slightly, and maybe not quite get what you wanted to get, but you get something. So. Yeah. Um, it's that collaborative working and uh, common sense approach. Okay, I'm just going to um, um, open it up for two more questions from the floor. Can I come to the gentleman on the left over there and also the gentleman on um, in blue on that table? Can I hear you first and then we'll um, go to that gentleman there? Okay. Thank you very much.
Sorry, do you want if we just come to the gentleman there first and then we hit them both yeah. together? Um, in terms of the capacity they had, in terms of the numbers, and in terms of the productivity that we actually had. So that's the reason why you see that some members of staff here in the, in the National Assembly Service were supporting the parliament as committee clerks, but they've been moved on somewhere else um, due to various reasons. They've hired a lot last year um, to provide more support and to also those that actually have capacity. In fact, um, there are a lot of graduates now that we actually have supporting us um, uh, as far as the, the, the committees are concerned. Um, but yet still, um, uh, the numbers actually are insufficient. Um, uh, so it's the responsibility of the clerk um, to let the authority know that we need to improve the numbers and uh, in terms of quality numbers, and then we can budget for that and then have an interview for those six. Now, recently we've conducted actual interviews um, uh, in terms of filling certain positions. There are some vacant positions still now in the parliament here. Um, recently, we've conducted interviews, um, um, and uh, finally, somebody has been hired. And the uh, next step is for the clerk to come and let the authorities know that we need to fill vacancy A, B, C, and D, uh, particularly the committee clerks that are lacking. Uh, we are all aware that they are overstretched. We know that. But you cannot just hire for the sake of hiring. We must have somebody who's, who could be very productive in terms of the capacity, in terms of the experience and stuff like that, um, like what was hired um, last year and the year before last. We have some very good quality um, committee clerks. So we hope um, before the end of the year or before the budget, the, the officer of the clerk will tell us exactly what, the, what numbers are they looking at, especially from the side of the HR. And then the authority will look at that and then capture that in our budget accordingly. Now to go to the, yes, the question from um, Honorable Jawara. You know, the, 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 um, the constitution is supreme. The clerk of the parliament is actually, you know, hired by members of parliament. And uh, you remember a few years ago, um, uh, when the, um, uh, the other clerk actually retired, there was a motion that was brought in parliament for this current uh, clerk to be upgraded to the clerk. He was a deputy clerk, uh, responsible for finance and admin. There was a motion, and we all agreed to, to you know, the motion passed, and that is why he is the clerk of the National Assembly. Now, let's say for someone known as in the clerk, let's say by tomorrow he resigns or he stops working here, then the authority would ad actually advise. We may advertise the position, but the position is not a political position. So we'll advertise it on the newspaper, just like any other position we have in the parliament here. Whoever is interested, we're going to go through the interview, and we may, we may make a recommendation to plenary. We bring it on, on board, and the plenary will make the decision on who they're going to choose. We may make two or three um, uh, you know, um, observations, and bring it to you guys, and then whatever we decide to do in terms of their CV, in terms of experience, in terms of being able to do the job, is up to us to decide. But the authority cannot decide that this is going to be the, the, the clerk of the parliament. However, if plenary chooses to, um, to delegate that authority to the, um, delegate that, um, that powers to the authority to hire the clerk, they will do just that. But that must come from plenary to give us the authority to do so. Otherwise, we have to bring it back to plenary for us to agree or to decide. Yeah. Um, I'm just wondering if either of our UK panelists wants to go on that before we move up questions. Okay, um, so yeah, I'll take two more questions from the floor. Um, this gentleman on the left here and then this gentleman on the right. Um, you first. Good. Uh, I don't know if you're going to go. Uh, I want to make uh, a couple of questions as well. Uh, uh, my own honorable is spoken about. Mm -hmm. Our parts are so overstretched that um, they have so many minutes, you know, you know, take care of. Uh, if the part is taking 
care of a test part and also taking care of environment, also taking care of another condition. But a single part, this is one part, uh, in fact, it takes a lot of time to actually work that part of the And sometimes, you know, in, in some of the occasions, one part will come and start the meeting, will go, another part will be coming and going. You know, you see the exchange of this in fact, that's interrupted. So I think all those things should be looked at. And what is explained? Mm -hmm. That if you want to appoint, it should not be for the sake of appointment. It has to be of, of a colleague who can figure out, giving the right as in the right. But that's not an excuse. The country is how many plus? Do you need 100 plus? Do you, are, are you telling me that it has to take you one year to appoint 100 people or, or 10, 20 people? It's more because and of course, it doesn't have to take you that long. So I think it, this is a necessity and it's it, it used a tight urgency for us to function very well and try our, our jobs as we want it to be done. Because we have to have trust and they need to do the job very well for us. Yeah. And the other thing also is that's for the welfare of the class. I want to ask you this question. And I know openly many people who try to be very muted about it, but deliberately I want to ask about it. You know, during every, every meeting that we conduct, we are paid as members, isn't it? Yeah. At committee level, but parts are not, and at, 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 at muted at, at the periphery, they discuss about whether they complain, you know, publicly or not. So I want to ask, you know, we, as authorities, we engage them as to why this is happening. So at, should they have these allowances that we get at the, uh, at, at the you know, for every meeting? And I also want to ask, extend this question to the members of the common to ask. If your class do have seen other ones, thank you very much. Um, so we have a question. Uh, yeah. Good morning. 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 Good Yes, um, and thank you very much, um, um, Honorable um, Masise. Um, you've asked a brilliant question um, in terms of the numbers pertaining to the clerks. Uh, I may also say that we have clerks that are on study leave for capacity building. We also have some that are on personal leave due to health conditions. And we can get more clerks, but we also have to be cognizant of the revenue that's been generated as a country. We need to do that. So we have to, it's a kind of like a blessing act. Because it's also our responsibility to ensure that we train our staff. And it's also our responsibility to ensure that when they want to go for training, we give them the right tools, the right materials, and above all the time, so that they can complete their studies and come back to work with us. We have done that in the past, and the same trend is actually continuing right now. We have, in fact, the director of committees right now is on, is on a study leave in the United Kingdom. And prior to him going, the director of Hansard was there as well. And prior to that, we also have some other committee clerks that have gone somewhere to study to capacity themselves. So we have those in, in place. Now, the question is, do you just go ahead and replace those on study leave, knowing fully that they will come back in nine months, or they'll come back in six months, or they'll come back in one year? Um, again, we need to look at it critically. Um, but we can understand that we need to improve on numbers. Uh, but it doesn't mean that anytime somebody goes on a study for one year, you have to replace automatically. You know, when they all come back now, we're going to say, you are our staff. So we are mindful of that, and that's the reason why we are managing the situation. But I quite agree, we need to increase the numbers, uh, but not to a level where if this will come back, we'll be our staff. Uh, you know, I quite agree with you. Now, in terms of allowances, um, you know, when the National Assembly, you know, gained its autonomous, you know, status as a, as a National Assembly service, there are a lot of changes in terms of the salaries not only for the members, but also for the staff of the parliament. Um, there are a lot of allowances that are currently being paid that was never paid before for the past you know, 20 years or more. Um, we are doing that just to ensure that we, we motivate them. And uh, whenever we are here, they are here. Sometimes we are here until midnight, 1 o'clock or 2 o'clock in the morning, they are also here with us. And that's the reason why we provide some other amenities like you know, you know, transport. Even though we give them transport allowance, but we also provide some with vehicles, some with fuels, Fuel as much as ten or twelve thousand a month to be able to care for those coming back to senior people. Um, we also um, provide 
additional you know services to them to just to motivate them but in terms of um, you know paying them like Sydney allowance whenever we are um, uh, the Sydney allowance is meant only for the members of parliament um, not for the class but they're that's what you're saying the sitting allowances whether it's committee meetings or sessions yeah exactly yeah whether it's session or committees committee meetings and stuff like that normally uh, parliaments don't pay on those things for the staff but in case they stay beyond a particular time frame my understanding is that they are paid over time for being with us over here we've seen that in the past where some that stayed with us through the night they have been paid a special allowance for staying with us through the, you know, throughout the night, especially during the budget sessions. Thank you. Um, just um, our UK panelists. Yeah. Um, just just on the UK uh, yeah. and clerks, the, the, they just pay the salary. Um, so whether they attend or not, they they, they get a the salary. And uh, so last question. Oh. And we're really fortunate. Very fortunate in uh, the UK. Well, no, no, I understand the question. Um, in that. Um, our, uh, we have the House of Commons Library and the researchers in there will give us information about our constituencies, they will give us anything that we need. But they also proactively send us monthly updates. So every month I will get an email from the House of Commons Library and tell me Glasgow North East, my constituency in the greatest city in Scotland, Glasgow North East has X number of people unemployed. Um, and all sorts of other statistics that you'd want to know about your constituency. But if I want them to find out more information, they generally will do that for you. I don't know how it works here. It sounds to me like we're kind of blessed with a much bigger budget in the, in the UK. Can I just come back to that? Uh, yes, yeah, you can break one off that. Uh, you, <clears throat> just, just one thing I just want to mention to you. Um, please don't get hung up on comparing what we do in the UK to what you have here. It is a totally different uh, scale of things. Uh, and that's because our country, I mean, we have what, nearly 70 million people live in the United Kingdom. So, you know, we have a much bigger uh, population. We have a much bigger economy. It is a totally different thing. Um, so, uh, you know, even our local councillors that operate on a regional basis um, don't have anywhere near the resources that we have in parliament. Um, so you, you've just got to take into account of, you know, what it is you're dealing with. But the key to all this is whatever resource you have is make sure you, you're using it effectively. Uh, and, but, but you can't compare what happens 